When I was a kid, I loved learning about animals. I still love learning about animals, and by some accounts, I'm still a kid, which is why today's video is about that topic. But instead of talking about how interesting this particular eel is, per se, I'm going to explain the general tree of life. Now, the tree of life is a name for the diagram that includes every organism and how they're connected, including regular trees. How meta. But you can't get more meta than metazoa, another name for animalia. We can break the name down into meta and zoa. Now, meta on its own is kind of a weird prefix. It's taken on the meaning of self-referential, but that's only based on the word metaphysics. On its own, the prefix typically means among or between, but in this context, I assume it's because zoa, which just means animals, can't really exist on its own. It would be too short. Animals are the multicellular movers, breathers, and eaters. Some other characteristics of metazoans is that they all contain collagen and they all develop from a hollow ball of cells. Whenever evolution occurs, things split into two. One group is the basal group, which stays the same, and the other is the derived group, which changes something. Generally speaking, a basal organism resembles the common ancestor and a derived organism doesn't. Back this far in the tree of life, we don't have the information for that sort of specifics, but what we do know is that the tree splits into periphera and eumetazoa. Eumetazoa is a lot easier to explain. The true metazoans are called that because they're the good, normal, and cool ones. Even though the other group technically fits the definition of animal, periphera means pore bearers because these are the sponges. Sponges don't have tissues, or in other words, all of their cells are the same without specialization, and they can't move as adults. By the way, we don't use the word characteristics, we use synapomorphies, which is just a more specific word for this thing. Eumetazoans, on the other hand, have even more cell specialization. Specifically, they're what's called diploblastic, meaning double developmental cell. This means they have two germ layers, the endoderm and the exoderm. The two layers each specialize into their own specific tissues. Eumetazoa is tricky. The conventional story is that it divides into parahoxazoa, parahox animals, and ctenophora, or comb bearers. Although we're not actually sure which branched off first, the sponges or ctenophores, this is just the most prevalent theory. Ctenophores are notable because they have coloblasts, or sticky cells, and parahoxazoa have a parahox and hox gene. These genes will be important as they extend into further lineages. They essentially work as middle managers, telling all the other genes how to work and where to go. Next up, parahoxazoa divides up into bilateria and cnidaria, two sides and stinging nettle. Now is probably a good time to talk about placozoa. Placozoans are painfully simple. Like the sponges, they have no tissue and reproduce asexually, but they're really just blobs of cells. Now, we know parahoxazoa divides up into these three, but it can only divide up into two at once, so we know two of these have to be more closely related than the third. For the longest time, those two were the jellyfish and placozoans. They even came up with a name for them, the planulozoa, or blobby animals, but now we're not so sure. It's more likely that it's the jellyfish and humans together, while the placozoans are separate. Some even think the placozoans and humans are together. But the most accepted layout is this, meaning planulozoa is now synonymous with parahoxazoa. The bilaterians are symmetrical at some point in their life. And the cnidarians have this cool thing that launches out of their body and stabs into things. A lot of cnidarians are what's called colonial animals, which means that they're actually just a bunch of tiny animals all working together. Now, I know what you're thinking. What exactly is the difference between a cell in a multicellular organism and a member of a colonial organism? Well, the idea is that colonials can survive apart from their colony. Another important deal with bilaterians is that they now have three germ layers. The ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm. But what if there was a hole in the middle? What? Like an empty space. What, in between the mesoderm and the endoderm? No, between the mesoderm and itself. This is called a coelom, and it was the derivation from bilateria. The basal group is therefore called a or although it actually includes a couple of random animals that don't even have an endoderm. <laughs> The other group is nephrozoa, kidney animals, so called that because they also have nephrons, which are these tiny little things that make up your kidneys. They filter the water in your body, and the third of their synapomorphies is the gastrointestinal tract. But that begs the question, if you recall from metazoa, we all develop from a hollow ball of cells. One hole of the gastrointestinal tract has to form first, and we need to decide which hole is it. If the cells of your blastula are offset from each other, the first hole you develop is the mouth, and your coelom and gastrointestinal tract develop separate from each other, you are a protostome. If your blastula is packed inefficiently, your anus is what forms first, and your coelom and gastrointestinal tract develop together, and then later separate, you're a deuterostome. You can remember this because they're helpfully named mouth first and mouth second. 
protostomes are subdivided into the crunchy protostomes and the chewy protostomes. The crunchy, or ectosozoa, are named after ectosis, the process where they have to shed their exoskeleton in order to grow. Spiralia are named after spiral cleavage, the technical term for this sort of thing, which they're way better at than ectosozoa. Deuterostomes, on the other hand, are divided into the guys with holes in their arms and the guys with string in their back. The ambulacraria are further divided into the hedgehog-skinned and the half-strings. All ambulacrarians further share the fact that they have a combined heart-kidney that pumps out excrement. The echinoderms all have five points and no head. The very, um, Freudian hemichordates are divided into three segments. The chordates are significantly more studied. They have five major synapomorphies. Pay attention, this will most definitely be on the test. A notochord. The notochord is the namesake of the chordates, a long, thin piece of strong but flexible material that allows for animals to get long without turning super floppy and useless. In development, it also provides an outline that the rest of the animal can be constructed along. A dorsal hollow nerve cord. Let's break it down. It's on your back. It's got a hole in the middle. It's made of nerves, and it's a cord. It allows for signals from the brain to be directed to the extremities. A lot of chordate things are a product or cause of their long, thin bodies. A post-anal tail. A tail that extends past the anus. A lot of chordates and apomorphies are lost in adult humans, but still clearly present in development. A pharynx, an area just inside the mouth but before the stomach, and that pharynx has slits in it. Now, these begin as tiny pockets in the endoderm, and then in most chordates, they break through to the exoderm. These are also present in many chordates. An endostyle, that's the term for this sort of organ, covered in fur that sits on the bottom of the pharynx and sprays mucus everywhere. The chordates then break up into the head chordates and the smellers. Olfactories, the smellers can, uh, s smell. Cephalochordata has myomeres. Look at these lines on a fish. That's myomeres. In cephalochordates, these are shaped like a V. They might be in all chordates, but we don't know because the tail chordates decided they would rather be a sponge. They don't have a coelom or nephron, and they can't move in their adult stage. Their counterparts, the jointed ones, are much more mobile. Vertebrata have six major synapomorphies. The first is some sort of hard tissue that can take a hit, which is used to form some sort of structure surrounding the dorsal hollow nerve cord, and often displacing the notochord, as well as some sort of case for the brain, which is now cut up into three parts and containing a pituitary gland. The final one is actually an additional germ layer, the neural crest. Pretty cool. Vertebrata is when things really kick off. They divide up into the circle mouths and jaw mouths. The cyclostomes are the boring ones, and the gnathostomes are very exciting. They have, in order of most obvious, jaws with teeth, teeth, jaws without teeth, but that sometimes do have teeth, fins, two chambered hearts, holes in the vertebral column, myelin sheaths, and more hox genes. So what do the hawks do exactly? Well, evolutionary speed is hampered by the fact that if you change something up too much, it's going to mess with the development stages, and the hawks genes help counterbalance that by organizing everything. In other words, gnathostomes can diversify much faster. The gnathostomes divide into cartilage fish and bone fish. Osteichthyes have bone. Chondrichthyes do not. They also possess an operculum, which is a bony plate-type thing that goes over the gills, and a swim bladder, which is a thing full of gas that lets them float. Chondrichthys divide into whole head and metal plate gills. Holocephaly have their jaw firmly attached to their skull, three sets of teeth, and four gills, while the elasmobranchi have their jaw loosely attached to their skull, infinite sets of teeth, and five to seven gills. Osteichthys divides into spiny fins and fleshy fins. Actinopterygii are the most diverse clade of vertebrates containing the major group known as teleos fish. The two are separated by whether the muscles controlling the fins actually extend down into the fins, hence the name. Breaking off from Actinopterygii, we have, in order, the sail branches, who can breathe air but don't like to, the cartilage bones, whose intestines are tied up in a knot, and the whole bones, who have a really weird-looking skull, finally ending in the complete bones, who have a tail that's symmetrical. Sarcopterygii divides into spiny sails and small bellows sails. Don't be fooled by the symmetry of the names, there are two species in this group. Actinistia have a tail that's symmetrical, but in a stupid way, and Ripidistia has lungs and enamel in the teeth. It also breaks up into double breathers and four legs. Um, I, I think you can tell the difference between these two just by looking at them. Tetrapoda divides into the smooth double lives and the bowl to collect the sacrificial blood. That is actually the etymology of amnion. The differences are marked between the two. Lysamphidians breathe through their skin and have no holes in their skull. Amniotes have a special egg with a shell, have a hole on either side of their skull, and have a three-chambered heart. 
Amniota splits into the lizard faces in the together circles. Sauropsids have an extra pair of holes in their skull under the previous, as well as a bump on the bottom of the jaw. They divide into... Actually, it's controversial what they divide into, but I'll just give you what I was taught, that being the guys that are shaped like the best lizards and the guys that are shaped like the scaly lizards, and then the archosauromorphs divide into turtles and the best lizards. The turtles are so unlike every other reptile, they could really be anywhere, though. Anyway, archosauromorphs have legs that go like this, and the lepidosauromorphs have legs that go like this. Archosaurs have two extra pairs of holes in front of the eyes and on the jaw. The turtles have no holes at all. The archosaurs split into birds, which walk on two legs, and the crocodiles, which don't. The leptosaurs divide into the nose heads and the scalies. The tuatarras have three eyes but no ears, and the lizards and snakes are normal. Back to synapsids. Synapsids see a bunch of extinct clades before we finally get to the titties. Mammals have a lot of major synapomorphies. The most obvious is that we all have hair. The second most obvious is that we all have nipples. And the third is that instead of having three jaw bones and one ear bone, we have one jaw bone and three ear bones. Beyond that, we all have exactly seven neck bones. We have a four chambered heart. And we have a muscle that contracts our lungs, which also divides our internal organs neatly in half. And finally, the most disgusting synapomorphy is that we all have fleshy lips and pharynxes that are designed to suck. All of these in coordination with breasts. Now, mammals divide into the beasts and the old beasts. The prototherians lay eggs and have one hole, hence the name, and the therians divide into the middle beasts and the good beasts. Metatherians shoot out the kid while it's still half-baked, eutherians do not, and they have a placenta which allows the kid to communicate with the mom while in utero. And that's it. That's pretty much all you need to know about cladistics. Well, that's not everything. I was lying when I said that lips were the grossest thing, there is one more. The metatherians have what's called a lateral vagina, meaning that the females have three vaginas, two for insemination and one for childbirth. In keeping, the males have a bifurcated penis, one that ejaculates out of two holes. Now, I've never actually interacted with the vagina of a eutherian, but I'm told they only have one. And I know what you're thinking, Zinioff, what about the one you were forced out of as a child? And that's kind of you to say, but I was actually born through C-section.